Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to welcome you to this online service of worship for Riverside United Church for Sunday, November 8th, 2020. My name is Dave Exley. I'm the lead minister for Riverside. And there is a lot going on in our world. No matter where we are in this place within our world that we find ourselves in, we're reminded that as people of faith, that we have a song to sing. We have so much to celebrate. We're reminded this day that, that God is with us in our singing, that God is with us in our dancing. And so through our music that we share in the service today, through the word, we hope, we hope that you hear God's spirit speaking to you, inspiring you today, lifting the weight from your shoulders today as you seek to walk the road with God and with so many other people of faith. I have some announcements to, to share at the end of the service here, so stay tuned for that, specific announcements for folks within our Riverside community. But as we enter into this time of worship, let us celebrate what it means to be God's people, what it means to share God's love within this world. Let us worship God in song. Our scripture reading for today comes from 1 Thessalonians. Many thanks to Todd Diaz for reading this passage of Holy Scripture for us today. A reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, we want you to know about people who have died so that you won't, be, won't mourn like others who don't have any hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose, so we also believe that God will bring with him those who have died in Jesus. What we are saying is a message from the Lord. We who are alive and still around in the Lord's coming definitely won't go ahead of those who have died. This is because the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the signal of a shout by the head angel and a blast of God's trumpet. First, those who are dead in Christ will rise. Then, we who are living and still around will be taken up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. That way, we will always be with the Lord. So encourage each other with these words. May the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. Well, friends, let us pray. O oh, creative God, source of all beauty, you give light to the soul. Open our hearts as we listen for your word and open our minds as we dream with you. Reveal your life-giving truth that comforts and disturbs us through Jesus the Christ. Amen. 
Well, for the past few weeks, a group of us from the church have been engaged in an online study focused on the book, The Bible Tells Me So by Peter Enns. And each week, I've returned to a quote from that book that captures the essence of what happens when we read Scripture. Enns suggests that when we open the Bible and read it, we are eavesdropping on an ancient spiritual journey. The Bible is not a rule book uh, or a book concerned with teaching us about science and world history. It is a compilation of books, letters, and poetry that provide for us a, a window into the spiritual journey of the, of the Israelites and the earlier followers of Jesus. The more we remind ourselves that this is what we are doing when we open the Bible, the more we will be enlightened as people of faith. With that in mind, let's look at the text for today. Well, Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica provides for us an incredibly unique picture of what the spiritual journey was like for the early Christian community. 1 Thessalonians is, is the oldest text in the entire New Testament. It was likely written sometime after the, the year 43 of the Common Era, a few decades before e either any of the Gospels were written. Not long after Jesus' public ministry is when this is written, his ministry in Galilee and in Jerusalem. And so, this letter gives us a unique window into what life was like for those early followers, those who chose to follow in the way of Jesus. Paul writes this letter to the community because he's been banished from the city, separated from this community of faith that he had founded. At the time, Thessalonica was a booming trade center and the capital city of the Roman province of Macedonia, a city located in what is now known as northern Greece. There is attention with the people of that time as they confront the reality that they live in a city that honored Julius Caesar as God and worshipped Emperor, Emperor Octavian as a son of God. Following in the way of Jesus was, was rooted in the dangerous political statement that Caesar was not God and being a son of God did not look at all like what the Roman Empire wanted the people to believe it looked like. A son of God for them was not someone who wore a gold crown or lived on the other side of a high wall or a fancy gate. Being kindred of God was something that everyone had access to and participating in that alternative kingdom looked more like the feeding of the 5,000 than a lavish feast set before a worldly king. The ruling power of the time had its thumb on the people of that region, and the truth that was accepted by many people living in Macedonia was far removed from the way, the truth, and the life that Jesus revealed through his life and through his teaching. The people that were a part of this early Christian community lived in fear and they experienced persecution for their beliefs. Why? Because what they believed represented a threat to the status quo, a threat to the ruling powers. And so as we eavesdrop on this ancient spiritual journey of the early community of followers, we see a few key things in this letter that Paul writes. First, we see a people who are filled with grief. Death is an ever-present reality for this community. They are in what seems to be a perpetual state of mourning for those that have been taken away from them, those that have been executed by the ruling powers. As a result, this letter from Paul comes to them as the clouds of despair have overshadowed their everyday living. It's easy to lose sight of God's light when the shadow of the empire looms over every moment of every day, when your loved ones have been ripped away from you, when you're constantly looking over your shoulder, wondering if you might be next. Not many of us, perhaps none of us, 
know what it's like to live with this as your everyday reality. We do, however, uh, have access to other things that can connect us to this text. We know what it's like to experience grief and loss, to know what it's like to lose those that we love, to be reminded of our own mortality. And perhaps like that early Christian community, we know what it's like to, to question God and to feel like life is incredibly unfair, particularly because our days are numbered and the pain associated with loss, with life in general, is so great. It's in these moments that I find myself reminded of a poem written by Dorothy Monroe, a poem that I share at almost every funeral I preside over. That poem speaks to not only the reality of, of life and of death, but it speaks to the gift of life when compared to the other alternatives that might be out there. I know a few of you have heard this before, but it bears repeating. It's something that can be a mantra for us in life as we're reminded of the goodness of what it means to live and breathe, most especially as people of faith. Dorothy Monroe writes, Death is not too high a price to pay for having lived. Mountains never die, nor do the seas or, or rocks or endless sky. Through countless centuries of time, they stay eternal, deathless. Yet they never live. If choice were there, I would not hesitate to choose mortality. Whatever fate demanded in return for life I'd give. For never to have seen the fertile plains, nor heard the winds, nor felt the warm sun on sands beneath a salty sea, not touch the hands of those that I love. Without these, all the gains of timelessness would not be worth one day of living and loving, come what may. There is a beauty to this reflection from Dorothy Monroe. She reminds us that life, even with all its pain and all its limits, all of its ups and downs, life is worth it. The hope that this gives me is, is not unlike the hope that Paul gives the faith community in Thessalonica when he writes to them. When Paul reminds them of the, the resurrection, he offers it to them as an ever-present gift that they have access to in their everyday living. It's as if he's saying to them, if Christ was able to live so fully, so can you. Even when death is, is knocking at your door, remember that God is still alive, still present with you, just as God was present with Christ. The ancient spiritual journey of this faith community has so much to offer us as we look upon these words of Paul. It has so much to offer us, particularly in moments of fear and hopelessness, those times that we experience within our life. The words of Paul remind us that we should, and what we should and should not fear. For in many ways, Paul is telling uh, God's people, don't fear the ruling powers. Don't even fear death. Instead, fear losing sight of God's way. God's way of peace, mercy, grace, and love. That's what our eyes should be fixed on. That's what we should fear losing. Not our life, but losing our way. Our greatest fear in life should not be death. It should be that, that we never dared to risk living wholeheartedly, living fully as God wants us to live. I'm not sure that I can improve on Dorothy Monroe's words when it comes to life and the beauty that life has to offer us. But perhaps we can merge the message of Christ with her message of hope as we imagine God speaking to us and saying these words. Death is not too high a price to pay for having lived. Mountains never die, nor do the seas or rocks or endless sky. Through countless centuries of time, they stay eternal, deathless. Yet they never live. If choice were there, I would not hesitate to choose mortality. Whatever fate demanded in return for life I'd give. 
for never to have fought for the rights of the poor, nor worked to understand and listen to people different from me, nor blessed the stranger, nor fought for equal rights, nor opened the door to the foreigner, nor forgiven others at a rate of seventy times seven. Without these, all the gains of timelessness would not be worth one day of living and loving. Come what may. Friends, what a gift it is to be able to eavesdrop on this ancient spiritual journey that the early church was taking, to eavesdrop on these words of encouragement that Paul provides for this community at such a vulnerable time, at such an uncertain time, a fearful time. For as we do it, we can listen to those words of Paul, receive them, and let them inform our daily living. For Paul, as he shares with these people, with the church in Thessalonica, he shares with them to not fear death, but he also shares with them that they should not fear life. For we're called as people of faith to to expand our living, to always lean into what it means to be fully human, to be fully present with one another within our world. For to live life to the fullest means that we must knock down all those barriers that our world creates. Barriers to to love, barriers to grace, barriers to mercy and forgiveness. God calls us to knock those down even when it means that we must risk everything. For as we do that, we're reminded that we are truly living in those moments. Friends, these are uncertain times. These are times where we find ourselves vulnerable. But I'm reminded of the words of Brené Brown, that great uh, speaker and writer, for she wrote not long ago that vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. We, much like the early Christian community, find ourselves at times in vulnerable places, but it's in these places that we get a sense of who we are, and whose we are. We get a sense of what it means to truly live and love. And so let us not fear death, but also let us not fear life. Let's lean into the gift of life in all of its glory. Let's celebrate what it means to live life to the fullest. For our time is limited, but love grace and mercy, all of those things are not limited. They can flow out into all the world for all time. We give thanks to God for that gift. Amen. And let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks this day for the gift of life, for the gift of the Prince of Peace, the gift of the Spirit. Oh God, lead us through the trials, the suffering and sorrow, the challenges and struggles, the tired times and dark places. Be with those who weep or cannot sleep, those who have no peace, those who seek release. Lead us, O oh God, with grace, with love, with peace. Fill us with hope, with patience, with stamina. Transform us in your image, in your Son, in your name. Transform us to grow, to understand, to see. Transform us that we can be made whole. And in wholeness may we be the hands and the heart of Christ. And now, wherever we are, we pause to lift up to you all of those people and places within our world that are on our hearts and minds this day. We offer them to you in prayer. And 
gracious God, as we attempt to shape ourselves in the way of your Son, we turn to you now and offer up that prayer, that ancient prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of God's Spirit. Go with the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Be blessed. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>